Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to continue my series on knot theory with a look at knot coloring. Probably the most fundamental question in knot theory is, how can we tell if two tangled strings have the same knot in them? Last time, we saw how to prove two knots were the same. All we had to do was find a way to transform one into the other. And we saw that any knot transformation could be made up from the three basic Reitermeister moves. But how can we prove that two knots are different? The key idea here is to find some property of a knot that doesn't change no matter how we rearrange the string. That is, we're looking for what's known as an invariant. And then if we find two knot diagrams have different values for some invariant, they must represent different knots. There are a lot of interesting knot invariants, and we'll look at several in depth in future videos, but the ones we'll start with today are the colorings and quandles. Say we have a knot diagram like so. And we have three colors, red, green, and blue, and we'd like to color each strand of the knot with one of those colors. How can we do that? Well, notice that at each crossing, we have three strands meeting, one going over the top and two meeting underneath. So a natural rule might be to make each of those three strands a different color, red, green, and blue. And sure enough, for this diagram, we can do that. But there's a problem with that rule. What happens if we add a loop? Well, it's still the same knot, so we'd like to still be able to color it. But at this crossing, two of the three strands are now connected. They're the same strand, so they must have the same color. which means that anything we do here will give us an invalid coloring, since the strand over top and one of the strands underneath have to be the same color. Okay, don't panic, we can fix this. This strand was all one color before we twisted it, so why not let it stay one color even when it's broken into two parts? That means that all three of the strands at this crossing must have the same color. And that gives us our rule. At any crossing, either all three strands are different colors, or all three are the same. In other words, we can't have two strands of one color and one strand of another. With this new rule, we'll always have at least three colorings. One all red, one all green, and one all blue. But some knots, like this one, will have more than that. And it turns out the number of valid colorings of a knot doesn't change no matter how we transform it. That is, the number of three colorings of a knot is our first invariant. We'll prove that in a moment, but first, let's look at some examples. Here we have the unknot. Clearly, there's only one strand, which we can color in three ways, for a total of three colorings. And whether we draw it like this, or like this, or like this, you can check that the number of colorings doesn't change. It's always just the three solid colors. As an exercise, you should also confirm that this really is a diagram of the unknot. For the trefoil, though, there are nine colorings as seen here. So the trefoil has a different number of colorings from the unknot. And any transformation we can do to a knot leaves the number of colorings unchanged. So there's no transformation that will turn one into the other. That means the trefoil must be different from the unknot. 
and we've finally proven that there really is a knot that can't be undone. As another example, for this square knot, there are 27 ways to color it, which means it's different from both the unknot and the trefoil. And you might notice that 3, 9, and 27 are all powers of 3. That's not a coincidence. If you're up for a challenge, try to show that that's always the case for any knot. I'd love to see your proofs in the comments below. So how can we show the colorings are invariant? We want to say that any knot transformation leaves the number of colorings unchanged. The trick is to find a one-to-one -one correspondence between colorings before and after a transformation. Recall from last time that any knot transformation can be made from the three Reitemeister moves. So all we need to do is find a correspondence for each of those moves. Say we have a knot diagram like so. If we focus in on this strand here, then we can use R1 to add a loop to it. And notice there's exactly one way to color this strand that's consistent with the coloring for the rest of the knot. We need to match these incoming red strands, so this strand must be colored red. Also notice there's exactly one way to color this loop that's consistent with the rest of the knot. Again, we need to match the incoming red strands, so this loop must be solid red. So there's one coloring of this strand and one coloring of this loop that are consistent with the coloring for the rest of the knot. So we can create a correspondence between this coloring of this diagram with this strand and this coloring of this diagram with a loop. Similarly, if we look at these two strands here, we can use R2 to cross one over the other. Once again, there's only one way to color these strands to match the rest of the knot we need to match the incoming blue and green strands. There's also only one way to color the crossed strands. Again, we need to match the incoming blue and green strands. And notice that for this middle strand here, it runs into this crossing, which has a green and a blue strand already. So by our coloring rule, this middle bit must be red. So again, there's only one coloring for each diagram consistent with the rest of the knot, and we can create our correspondence. And if we have a strand next to a crossing like so, then we can use R3 to pull the strand over the crossing. Again, there's only one possible coloring for each of these, so that gives us a correspondence. For completeness, we should also confirm that the correspondence exists even when some or all of these strands for R2 or R3 are the same color or in different permutations, but I'll leave that as an exercise for you. So if we have two diagrams of the same knot, there's a sequence of Reitemeister moves to transform one into the other. And if we have a coloring for the first diagram, each of those moves gives us the coloring for the next using the correspondence we defined over here. So following through these one at a time, we get a unique coloring for our final diagram. So any coloring for this diagram corresponds to a coloring for this diagram and vice versa. We have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And that means there must be the same number of colorings. That is, the number of three colorings is invariant. Okay, great. We finally got a tool that lets us prove that knots are different. Is it powerful enough to distinguish between any two knots? Well, no.
Each of these knots can only be colored with a solid color, so it only has three colorings. But they certainly don't look like the same knot. Is there still some way to distinguish them? Notice that this knot on the left has a five-way rotational symmetry. So maybe there's some way to color this with five colors instead of three. How can we adjust our coloring rules to allow that? Let's lay out our five colors in a circle, like so. And say at some crossing, we have the two lower strands are blue and purple. What color should the top strand be to make this consistent? Well, I'd expect the answer to be the same whether these strands are blue and purple or purple and blue in the other order, since you can get one from the other just by turning the board around. So we want something that's symmetric relative to those two colors. And the only color in this circle that does that is the one halfway between them, which is orange. So the top strand here should be orange. And that gives us our general rule. The color for the top strand should be the one halfway between the colors for the bottom two strands. And for this knot, we get 25 colorings, like so. But for this knot, we only have the five solid colors. So this five coloring rule proves that these are different knots. And there's nothing terribly special about five, except that it's odd. We could equally well do this same construction with seven or nine or any other odd number of colors. And at this point, it's common practice to stop drawing colors and to start using numbers modulo whatever odd number you're using. But the idea is exactly the same. We're coloring strands according to this symmetry rule. With all of these colorings, surely now we have enough information to distinguish all knots, right? Again, no. We still don't have any way to prove that, for example, the figure eight knot is different from the unknot, no matter how many colors we throw at it. Well, maybe we can change the rules again to allow even more colorings. Our old coloring rule was determined by the symmetry of the two understrands. But we can break that symmetry by giving the knot a direction, which we'll denote with these little arrows along its length to show which way the knot is going. Then every crossing will have a top strand, a left strand relative to that top strand, and a right strand. Once again, we'd like the colors of two of those strands to determine the third. So if we call the color of the right strand x and the color of the top strand y, then the color of the left strand should be some combination of x and y, which we'll call x triangle y. We'd also like this coloring to play nicely with the Reitermeister moves. And each of these moves will give us some constraint on this triangle operation. For instance, at this loop here, we have x intersecting x, so this third strand must be x triangle x. And to be consistent with this unlooped strand here, these must be the same color. So x triangle x must be equal to x. And similarly, looking at the colors for these other two moves, we get these other two rules. Any operation that satisfies these three rules will give us an invariant number of colorings. And a collection of colors, together with a valid triangle operation, is known as a quandle. Here we have some example quandles that let us distinguish even more knots. Notice that the colorings we saw before are all quandles, which happen to be commutative. So x triangle y is y triangle x. But now we have a much wider range of colorings to work with. 
If we look at the multiplication table for some quantal, this first rule tells us that the diagonal will be 1, 2, 3, and so on. And the second rule tells us that every color must appear in every column, but not necessarily every row. There may be repeats. The third rule is sort of like the distributive rule. As far as I know, there's no nice way to see it in the multiplication table, but let me know if you find one. If you're curious to know more about quandals, you can pause the video here and work through these examples. And I'll link some papers in the description if you want to know more. These colorings and quandals have been a great first step toward identifying knots. But is that the full story? If we're given two knots, is there always a quandal that distinguishes them? The answer is yes, in theory. The proof is well outside the scope of this series, but it turns out we can always tell two knots apart with a quandal. But doing that in practice is another matter. As far as we know, there's no efficient way to find such a quandal. So for distinguishing knots, quandals aren't always the most useful tool. Fortunately, there are other techniques that we can use to distinguish knots. We have, for example, the whole fields of topology and algebra at our disposal. So join me next time as we discuss fundamental groups. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.